Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on understanding child labor laws as they relate to manufacturing and building trades, youth apprenticeship placements. My name is Brian Kenny, and I'm with the Transition Improvement Grant. And today I will be joined by Jim Cialino with Department of Workforce Development, who will provide some great insight into updates on our child labor laws as they relate to youth apprenticeship placements for our youth in manufacturing and building trades. The Transition Improvement Grant, also known as TIG, is funded through a Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction grant. The Transition Improvement Grant was established in 2013. Our mission is to provide develop, professional development to educators, youth, families, and transition partners to ensure every child graduates college and career ready. The TIG project also provides professional development, opportunities, technical assistance, and information to promote the understanding and implementation of the transition requirements and the effective practices found in the Individuals with Disabilities Act, IDEA of 2004. Just a few save the dates as they relate to our um, professional development that we offer, which all of our professional development is um, free to attend. Uh, you simply need to have an account and you can sign up for an account at www.witig.org. We have a, a transition collaboration network meeting coming up next week on March 10th, and that's from 8.30 to 3.30 p.m. at the Best Western Conference Center in Plover, Wisconsin. We also have uh, a very popular event coming up in April. Um, this will be our second annual County Communities on Transition CCOT retreat. Uh, last year's event was very well attended, over 100 uh, participants. Uh, this year we hope to exceed that number and bring in representation from all of our county communities on transition statewide. Uh, that date is April 24th, 2015 from 8.30 until 3.30 uh, at the Wilderness Glacier Canyon Conference Center in Wisconsin Dells. Uh, just to save the date, uh, the 2015 Wisconsin Statewide Transition Academy uh, will be held next year on October 29th and 30th. That's also at the Glacier Canyon uh, Conference Center in Wisconsin Dells. New this year, the Transition Academy will be a two-day event and it'll be packed with information related to all areas of transition. The conference is a perfect get-together for all, whether you are an agency member, teacher, paraprofessional, parent, or student. Again, this event is free as are all of our professional development opportunities. Uh, more information on the Transition Academy will be coming soon to our website, www.witig.org. Just a few features of today's webinar. Uh, you will be muted uh, to enhance sound quality. Mics will be remained muted throughout the webinar. You can, however, uh, communicate with uh, our panelists and presenters by simply using the Q&A uh, question and answer uh, feature, which you can see by the arrow is located at the bottom of your screen. To submit questions, just click on the questions and answers icon, which again is located at the bottom of your screen and we will respond to those questions. Uh, at some point in time during the webinar, we'll also have um, Lisa, our administrative assistant uh, for our grant, will um, read off questions to um, Jim, our presenter, and we will be able to answer your questions in great detail and have some uh, good discussions. So please feel free to uh, save your questions, um, submit them to us, uh, and don't forget to, to ask your questions. Today's webinar is all about, um, you know, meeting your needs and getting answers to you regarding um, some of our updates to our child labor laws. Here's what the uh, question and answer will, will look like. Uh, you'll see a series of response from the panelists or the presenters. Um, some questions can be sent anonymously. So again, feel free to uh, use the Q&A panel and, uh, and we can get you some uh, good high quality response. Again, thank you for participating in today's webinar. Just a little update on um, our next webinar uh, will be on April 27th. 
2015 from 3.30 to 5.30 p.m. Uh, we'll be doing a webinar on dual enrollment options for students with uh, intellectual disabilities. Um, if you're looking for some great ways to connect with your local University of Wisconsin campus or your Wisconsin Technical College, the Think College model will increase your post-secondary outcomes for your 18 to 21 year old students. Uh, this webinar will focus on two different programs, the Campus Connect program, which is a cooperative program between Madison College and Madison Metropolitan School District and a collaborative program between the University of Wisconsin Baraboo, Sauk County campus, their two-year campus, and Sauk Prairie and Baraboo school districts. These Think College models represent both urban and rural perspectives. Participants will gain resources and skills to develop the first steps towards implementing a post-secondary program utilizing the Think College model. This is a very exciting opportunity for us to collaborate with uh, numerous um, ambassadors and partners that can help us better understand uh, how students with intellectual disabilities can receive uh, college credit while they're in high school. Uh, we will be working with Molly Cooney from the Wiseman Center, um, who heads up the uh, Think College program. Liz Kennedy from Sauk Prairie uh, School District, she's the transition coordinator. Eric Hartz from the Madison Metropolitan School District and Madison College, the coordinator of the Campus Connect program and Matt Gerblin from UW Baraboo, uh, Sauk County. Now, let's meet Jim. Jim Ciolino has worked for the Department of Workforce Development since 1991 with a very short detour in private practice. He has worked with both of the Equal Rights Divisions Bureaus, the Civil Rights Bureau and the Labor Standards Bureau. He currently serves as Assistant Administrator of the Equal Rights Division and Director of the Labor Standards Bureau. Jim has a master's degree in public administration and also has a degree from UW-Milwaukee and a Juris Doctorate degree from UW-Madison. And again, my name is Brian Kenny, and I help support school districts in CESA 2 and 3 with the Transition Improvement Grant. So I'm the Southern Region Coordinator and our grant uh, helps improve the outcomes for youth around Indicators 13, which is the post-secondary transition plan and Indicator 14, which is post high school outcomes survey. So we're very excited about today's webinar. And I will get right to Jim's presentation. And I'm going to give Jim control of the webinar. So, Jim, thanks for being with us today and look forward to hearing some great information on uh, child labor laws and manufacturing and building trades. Thank you. Uh, we're going to talk uh, about the laws that we enforce in the Equal Rights Division related to child labor. And, you know, I know you have a special interest in how they relate to the youth apprenticeship placements in uh manufacturing and building trades um i'm as the director of the labor standards bureau here and in the bureau we've got two sections we've got our prevailing wage section and that section deals with uh setting rates and enforcing those rates for people who work in public construction projects and then everyone else and that's about 12 of our employees who work uh, enforcing all of the other laws that we uh, oversee in the Labor Standards Bureau. And that includes child labor laws, but about 19 or 20 other laws that we have picked up over the years. Um, most of the work that we do is involving uh, uh, wage claims. So when somebody doesn't get paid, we take those claims and we try to collect for the people who uh, file complaints with us. Um, but we do quite a bit of business with the child labor law, and especially I like to go out and talk to folks who are considering placements in, in youth apprenticeship. So I'm trying to figure out how this works. Um, so generally speaking, uh, the child labor law works this way. We uh, prohibit certain types of work based on the age of, the, of a minor uh, and the type of equipment that's used. So, the, And this is the federal law as well. 
who will say that certain work is prohibited, um, not allowed for minors under the age of 18 or under the age of 16, depending on how really how hazardous the piece of equipment or the job is. So there is a provision in the rule, though, that allows student learners to work in part, sometimes in work that is otherwise prohibited. And youth apprentices are one subset of the student learners. So to be a student learner, you a, a student must be, and, and when we're talking here, we're just talking about people under the age of 18. We don't regulate anyone that's 18 and over. So all my discussion here is gonna be talking about under the age of 18 kids. Usually it's just the 16 and 17 year olds, but I'll tell you when I'm talking about something different. So student learners is the first thing. It's a concept that allows kids to do work that otherwise would be prohibited under certain circumstances. So to be a student learner, the minor must be attending an accredited school, has to be employed on a part-time basis to obtain scholastic credit and employment training. This has to be very clearly uh, a, a cooperation between the schools and the employers. There also must be a written school to work training agreement. This is part of the, the rule. And that agreement is between the student employer and the school and youth apprenticeship does this. The student learner agreement has to include certain things. The first thing it needs to include is, is a provision that says that any work prohibited under the child labor rule, that's DWD 270.12 or 270.13, any work that's prohibited there is incidental to the student learner's training and for intermittent and for short periods of time. The, the regulations don't explain what that means, intermittent or short periods of time, but we sort of follow what the wage and hour division does with that. And they interpret those terms to mean that the student learner can't be the principal operator of prohibited machinery usually it's a piece of machinery that I, we're, we're prohibiting. He or she must work under the close supervision of a fully qualified and experienced adult, such as a journeyman. Uh, the duties assigned to the minor may not be such that he or she is constantly operating the prohibited machinery during the work shift, but only doing so as part of the training experience. And there needs to be training uh, and, and we'll talk about that as we go further, but there needs to be training that helps them do, uh, do, do the work on the otherwise prohibited piece of equipment. This would preclude an apprentice or student learner from working, operating prohibited machinery or performing prohibited tasks. Uh, the wage and hour division considers the continuous performance of otherwise prohibited work that exceeds one hour a day to be more than intermittent. So the prohibited work can't be any more than an hour a day. And they also say that it can't be more than 20% of the student learner's work shift uh, would be for short periods of time. So that's on the average, no more than an hour a day, um, no more than 20% of the student's work shift. Also, again, I'm sorry, go back. And then uh, also as part of that student learner agreement, there has to be uh, safety instructions, we mentioned that, that, that are given by the school and correlated by the employer with on, on the job, on time job training. The schedule of organized, the, the agreement has to have a schedule of organized and progressive work processes that are to be completed on the job. And the youth apprenticeship program is set up that way. We have a new publication that you can find on our website. And I wonder, can you click through to the web on there? Or, you want me to pull up the publication? Could, yeah. yeah. And I can show you what it looks like. Uh, it's uh, a publication that we worked kind of hard on, uh, entitled Manufacturing and Construction Equipment and Wisconsin's Child Labor Laws. And What's the website, Jim? It's dwd.wisconsin. Spelled out, .gov, slash er. And then we'll, we'll walk you through it here. So um, child labor, if you could click on more child labor information down here, yeah. and then scroll down. And the document, it's this manufacturing and construction equipment. 
So this is what it looks like, and you can we will get a copy to you certainly, but it's on our website and available. And it, it goes into some, I think, good detail about, starts off by talking, explaining the student learner exemption, first of all, uh, related to kids working in manufacturing and construction. Uh, minors under 15 can't be in factories, essentially. They can't be working in manufacturing or processing occupations. So that means 16 and over really is probably all you can have in uh, factories. Um, and that even the student learner exception doesn't allow them to work in in factories. So the student learner exemption, uh, this explains what that is and basically gets into what we've already talked about or what, about what a student learner is. On the pages that follow that though, you'll see that we've got pieces of equipment. You know, you wonder whether a miner can use a CNC router uh, just generally. Is it okay under 16? No, it's not okay under 16. You'll see that on the table. Okay, 16 and over. Yeah, that's okay, 16 and over. And that is even apart from the student learner exemption. So that means that there's not a restriction on the amount of time that a, a minor could use a CNC router where you see yes in that middle column. And there are some then uh, explanations about some of that. You'll, you'll see if maybe we scroll down a little bit, we'll see, I guess the next page. We'll see, oh yeah, like where it says flanging machines, not okay under 16. Okay, 16 and over, no, it is not okay for 16 and over, but you'll see a yes in that third column. And that means this is where the student learner exemption is really coming into play, that they couldn't do this if they weren't a student learner. They couldn't do this kind of machine, use this kind of machine at all uh, if they weren't a student learner, but in the apprenticeship, students can use these kinds of machines as long as they meet those other criteria we were talking about that it's intermittent and for short periods of time so you'll this is alphabetical this table you've got here and it should we hope it answers as many questions as you get from employers uh, you're trying to bring into the program if not we're happy to talk to them and try to figure out whether the piece of equipment is okay generally or okay only for student learners. But either way, the student learning exemption does help quite a bit. So I hope that publication can be helpful for you. Um, go back to the chart. Sure. There we go, thank you. And so, um, as we said, it's the, the document has a list of equipment commonly used in manufacturing, also construction jobs, and explains when miners may use that equipment. So miners in Wisconsin generally have to have work permits before they go to work. Uh, anyone under the age of 18, there are some exceptions to that. They're not required for students working under a youth apprenticeship agreement. However, the Youth apprenticeship folks here in Madison do like the employer to obtain a work permit for the minor, um, even if they are in the youth apprenticeship program. And what that, I think the reason for that is that it documents that the minor is doing work that they are allowed to do under the law, and that if there's an injury, it's not going to be uh, cause any difficulty. Because in this, this is not in the PowerPoint, but I'm going to just go off on a little tangent and talk about uh, what can happen if a minor is injured on the job. So workers' comp laws apply, because these are employees. Kids in youth apprenticeship programs are employees, and uh, workers' comp applies. If they are injured and have a work permit and are doing work that is permitted, then workers' comp is paid as normal if, if there's an injury that is compensable. If the minor is injured and does not have a work permit and is required to have one, then the, there are double penalties that the employer has to pay for not getting a work permit. So the youth apprenticeship kids, they're not required to have one. There isn't a problem if there's no permit, but it can cause a delay in some of the processing if they don't have one. I will tell the workers from people, no, there's no permit, not knowing that the minor is in a youth apprenticeship program. 
So it, there's just sometimes a delay there. The other thing to keep in mind is that if a miner is injured doing work that is prohibited, that they weren't supposed to be doing, then there could be a triple penalty. Workers' comp uh, monetary amounts are, are triple to the employer. And that's a penalty that their insurance carrier will not pay. So it's a penalty to the employer. Um, so what does that mean? If the miner is not in a youth apprenticeship program, is working and is using prohibited equipment and is injured, that can be very expensive for an employer. But if they're in youth apprenticeship and they're following the rules, allowing the miner to work on otherwise prohibited equipment just occasionally and intermittently um, for short periods of time, they're not going to have a problem. But if that miner is working on that machinery constantly, that is not per permitted under the youth apprenticeship law. So there could be some damages if the miner is injured uh, while performing that work. Now, we, we don't see a lot of issues with youth apprenticeship here, um, simply because employers who are in youth apprenticeship, they're following the rules for the most part. We just don't see complaints. If we ever see something, if ever something ever pops up, it's usually in this area that a miner was injured and there's some uh, indication that they were working on prohibited equipment more than they should have been. And so our investigators would look into that. Um, we've got sort of a short list of types of work that are prohibited under student learner agreements. That what this means is that even if they're a student learner, there are still some things they can't do. And I mentioned the first one, manufacturing, although I'm not that one. The last one on the list, manufacturing, mining, and processing applications, that's prohibited to kids under 16 always, even if they are student learners. It's okay for 16 and 17 year olds always. Um, then pieces of equipment or different sorts of things like coal mining, always going to be prohibited. You can't have a student learner in a coal mine. You can't have them working with explosives. You know, it's really, if you look at it, it's the really hazardous stuff that they still can't be doing it, even if they are student learners. You'll see hoists and hoisting apparatuses listed there. That one is a little, you know, it's a little deceiving just to say they can't do it because the law itself, the rule that says kids under 18 can't use hoists and hoisting apparatuses is a very long regulation. And it says, yeah, here, here's the things they can't do, but here's the things they can do. And there are certain things that they can do uh, under 18, even if they aren't student learners. Um, logging, sawmills, I think that speaks for itself, radioactive things. Motor vehicle drivers and outside helpers is another area where we do get a lot of questions, but that they can't be doing work as a, as a vehicle driver uh, unless it fits within the very narrow exceptions in that law. And I think that's further down on the, um, in the presentation. We'll talk about that in a little more detail. Next slide. So in construction, the things that you need to know are that there are prohibitions against operations of cranes, elevators, these are the hoists and hoisting apparatuses, uh, hoists, high lift trucks, man lifts, or freight elevators, metal forming, punching and shearing, power driven machinery, those sorts of things are prohibited generally. And that's generally, as I said before, but a student learner can use those machines, metal forming, punching, because it doesn't show up on that list of things that they can never do. <laughs> Hoist and hoisting apparatuses does show up on that list. They can never do prohibited work there. But metal forming, that's okay for student learners as long as it's, it's uh, occasional, intermittent, and for short periods of time. Operating or helping with power saws is generally prohibited to minors under 18, but it's okay. Uh, with full automatic feed and ejection for any minor on 16 and over. Um, but student learners, you can operate those things even if they are prohibited. Woodworking. There are just some, a few little things in woodworking. Minors can't operate power driven machinery, uh, including supervising or controlling feeding or helping to feed materials when they're power driven woodworking machines. Uh, and that's another one where 
it, it's prohibited to minors, but if they're youth apprentices or student learners, they can do those things, use the nailing things, the stapling, wire stitching, as long as they are student learners and doing them, you know, within those restrictions we talked about, that it's occasionally intermittent for short periods of time. Roofing is prohibited uh, under the child labor laws. All work performed on or about a roof. The uh, Wisconsin law prohibits this. The federal law doesn't. Uh, we've had, and sometimes these things are precipitated by accidents that have happened. We've had some serious injuries, and, and I think there was a death, but there at least was a 17-year-old who fell off a roof, didn't have any safety equipment on at the time, and uh, was paralyzed from the neck down. So, you know, it's very serious to not uh, follow the rules with respect to roofing. We prohibit it. We allow it for student learners intermittently and occasionally. Hoist and hoisting apparatuses. I already mentioned this, except to mention that the law does allow 16 and 17 year olds to operate floor jacks, service jacks, hand jacks. Usually these are in service stations, re repairing or servicing motor vehicles. And then in, in manufacturing, generally we're looking at the machine to determine if the work is prohibited. Metal form woodworking, I mentioned already. The machine must be equipped with automatic feed and ejection and with fixed barrier guards to prevent hands and fingers from entering. This is for 16 and 17 year olds generally and not just for student learners that if there is automatic feed and ejection, basically you can't get your hands in there, it's gonna be okay for minors. And again, if in doubt, contact us. This is the motor vehicle uh, ex exclusion that we sort of brushed by before. It's just that it's a little complicated and, and I wanted to make sure that we talk about it in some detail. I know in many, many jobs today, kids are asked to drive as a little part of the job. Um, it's very difficult to have a, a kid, a minor, uh, drive as a regular part of the job. For example, anybody under 17 should not be driving, period, as part of the job. And this is on public highways. If they're moving vehicles around a car lot or something like that, that's okay. But public highways is really the issue. So the driving hat for 17 year olds, they can do it only if driving is occasional, incidental, incidental, that means it's not a regular part of the job, restricted only to daylight hours. Driving takes place within 30 mile radius of the minor's place of employment. The motor vehicle has to be a small one, not exceeding 6,000 pounds gross vehicle weight. And the minor has to have completed driver's ed and have a valid license. Has, the minor can't have a record of any moving violations. That would have left me out of it at 16 because I had a speeding ticket really early in my career. Uh, vehicle has seat belts for all occupants and the employer has has to instruct the minor on how to use the seat belts. That seems unnecessary, but it's in the rule. The driving does not involve towing a vehicle, so there are things that the driving can't be, even if it is, meets all those other things. It can't be towing, route delivery, transportation for hire of property, goods or passengers, can't have more than three passengers who are employees of the employer. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's the motor vehicle restriction. Um, a few things to remember about child labor and uh, the student learner exception in, in particular. That the student learner exception uh, is based on the premise that the minor is receiving related educational instruction at the workplace and during class time. That they're really, it's a learning experience. The employer in many of these cases doesn't gain a lot other than maybe a pipeline Eventually, they'll have somebody that they'll have who's, who they've known and who has done a good job for them. But in the initial stages, employers can't really expect to get a lot out of the student learners. They're learning. And, you know, I think actually many, many employers like it as a pipeline to get kids into their place of employment. The employer and the school have the burden to ensure that the minor is receiving that ongoing education, that the work is within the restrictions of the child labor regulations. The, the, ensuring that the work with it is within the child labor regulations is really on the employer. We, to my knowledge, we've never gone after a school 
for a situation where the minor was doing something that they shouldn't have been doing. It's really the employer. The, we also can sometimes hold parents accountable, but not for prohibited employment types of things, but for when, if they're allowing kids to work uh, at times of day or hours that they shouldn't be working knowingly. So we could allow, we could pursue the parents for violations and have not recently, it's probably been 10 years since there's been a situation like that. And in that situation, um, it was a parent who was closely related to the business owner, so it was a little difficult. Um, so it's also important to remember that if the minor has become proficient at a job, there need to be new educational opportunities. Otherwise, really, it's not a learning experience anymore. Uh, they may not qualify if they're no longer receiving educational experience. So sometimes employers will keep student learners after the school year is over. They're, they're doing a good job for them, but they're not student learners during the summer when there's no instruction going on. So the employer just really needs to keep in mind that different restrictions may apply during those vacation periods. And then this is just sort of something we want everyone to, to keep in mind. Minors have to have a break when they're working. If they're working longer shifts, they can't work longer than six consecutive hours without a 30 minute uh, meal period. Adults don't have to have breaks, but of course we recommend that breaks be given to everyone. But for kids, it is required. Start and stop times of breaks should be documented and that's for the employer's protection in case we end up auditing. We will mark that as a violation if we find there was no break for a shift longer than six hours. So we also indicate here that the hours limits have been changed. So the hours that minors are restricted to changed effective July 1st, 2011. They now match the federal rules. Essentially, 16 and 17 year olds are not restricted at all, except that they can't work when they're supposed to be in class. And that's their individual class schedule, not the school's work hours. Um, I mean, the, the school scheduled hours. Minors under 16 are limited to working no more than three hours per day on school days, no more than eight hours per day on non-school days. And then the times of day they can work and the total number of hours they can work per week will depend on whether it's the summertime, meaning uh, June 1st through Labor Day under the federal and state rules now, or during the school year, Labor Day through May 31st. Overtime is required for anybody working anyway. If they're working more than 40 hours a week, they have to be paid time and a half for those hours in excess of 40. But if the 16 and 17 year old kids are working long days, they also have to be paid time and a half after working 10 hours per day, uh, whichever is greater, 40 hours a week, 10 hours a day, whichever is greater. Minimum wage rates, generally, you need to know there is no separate minimum wage rate for minors. It is 7.25 an hour. There used to be, some of you may remember that, but it's just the same as the general minimum wage rate now. Um, there is this provision in the law, though, that allows uh, opportunity employees to be paid this lower rate, 590 an hour for the first 90 consecutive calendar days of employment, not business days, calendar days of employment. Uh, and that applies to anyone under the age of 20. Uh, and then on the 91st day, they have to be increased to seven and a quarter an hour. Also, they can't be terminated just to make room for another person who can make 590 an hour. That can come in handy to train people, to get them in and trained. Um, the federal law has a similar concept, but the rate is lower, it's 425 an hour. So employers have to comply with both. The only way to do that is to pay at least 590 an hour. So that is the presentation. I'd be happy to take any questions that may have come up during this uh, time we've had. Lisa? Yep, I'm pulling it up right now. Okay. Um, Juliet asked, her first question was, am I to understand that student learners are not permitted to operate any motor vehicle while on the job, even with a valid license? 
she said that you answered her for qu first question, but not sure about the front end loader part. Um, even if it was just a child, um, she had, let's see here. She had a student operate a front end, front end loader while on the job, but not very long, the employer just had him try it. I am assuming this is not legal now. It, it never was legal. A front end loader is a hoist and is not allowed for minors under 18, even if they are student learners. Okay, and um, she, she, wants to know, she wants to know, she says, I think I understand that the school would not be in trouble, but the employer would. That's correct. We, we don't hold the school accountable for those things. Okay, and then there was another question about um, your PowerPoint, if we could post that on our website or get it emailed out to people. Otherwise, um, Julie, the other Julie asked about this. Um, Julie, this will be uh, post, the entire webinar will be posted on our website as well. Yeah, along with the child labor um, uh, flow chart that showed things that student learners can do that may be prohibited for kids that are between the ages of 16 and 18. So we'll include that chart as well. Okay, those were the only two questions that I had. Any, any other questions people have or feedback about possible topics for future webinars as they relate to, we're always looking for good suggestions on dual enrollment webinars or webinars related to school to work, uh, work-based learning. Yes, Julie, the, all the information will be posted on the website and I will send out a personalized email uh, either tomorrow or Friday. Um, including the uh, PowerPoint as a PDF. Um, that way it's um, not able to be edited, as well as um, the recording. Um, we'll post that on our website, and I'll also, um, I can send that out as a Google Doc. It's much easier to upload that way through Google. It's a big file, so it usually doesn't attach to most emails. And then I will send out the child labor guide that um, Jim created. Uh, for manufacturing and uh, building trades, youth apprenticeships. Possible. We're always, like I said, we're always looking for ideas. Put it in the list for next year. Um, we're planning, you know, some of our webinars. We want to, you know, do more interactive webinars so people can, you know, learn lots of things about ways to get their kids out into the community and engage in integrative employment opportunities, paid work experiences. Uh, nothing? Okay. Well, thank you, Jim, for for uh, hosting hosting me at Department of Workforce Development. Maybe I can take a, a little tour since I have a little bit of time. And um, thank you, Lisa, for uh, running the, the chat room and helping us with administrative duties of the webinar. You bet, Brian. We did have one more question come in. Um, they want to know if they can share the PowerPoint with regular ed staff in the building. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, this is uh, this is great. When you bring this stuff back to your building, it's for sure going to be a team approach, and uh, everybody will will want to see this. This is uh, I know I um, I know somebody who is a uh, an owner of a big roofing company in the Dells. And all the material that I just learned today, um, I'm going to share with, with them because they've been having a desire to work with students with disabilities and some of the, the non-student learner um, provisions would have prevented us from, you know, having some of our 16-year-olds do that. But now if they're in a youth apprenticeship situation, they, uh, they might be more open-minded because of these. Uh, and it's a really nice flow chart, too, so it's easy to read. Yeah, by all means, please share with your community members, your regular ed staff, um, your building principals. Employers you might be reaching out to, definitely. You know, they, I get calls from employers all the time wanting to know 
I, you know, I, I'm told I can't have my have kids doing this work. Is that true? You know, and and we we're happy to answer those questions. But I think that document really helps. Yeah, absolutely. So well, hopefully this was helpful to you. And um, again, thank you for uh, for attending. And hopefully the process of the ACT tests and the work keys went smoothly. And um, we can all move on to a happy Thursday tomorrow. So have a great have a great evening. And uh, thanks again for attending.